Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz saxophonist and composer Greg Ward. We talked to him on June 13th, 2020 during the COVID-19 world of No Live Jazz about a great many things. He was born in Peoria, Illinois and is now based in Chicago. He's had the opportunity to perform and record with a variety of artists like Prefu 73, Tortoise, William Parker, and Mike Reed, along with others over the years. Get to know him and dig this interview. Hey, how's it going, Joe? Hey, good, man. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Good. Hey, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Chaz. Of course. So let me ask you this. You know, I want to get into your life and music, but I want to kind of start with COVID-19. When, in, say, early to mid-March, did you start seeing kind of the door closing to live music? What was your personal story? Well, actually, it started a little earlier for me because I was on tour in uh, in February. In the beginning of February, I was on this Eastern European tour, and, you know, we were starting to hear things about the virus um, then. And I remember specifically, you know, um, you know, borders throughout Europe were starting to take different measures. They were starting to do things like take people's temperatures and, and, you know, we, we were all we were finishing up this tour um, with a great tenor player named Igor Lombard, who's from Slovenia. I mean, all the tours that I would do with him would be in the you know more Eastern European um, place. And just one experience on that tour that we had was um, we were on a bus going from Croatia into Hungary, and when we get to the border. Um, you know, they they tell us that we're going to have to get off the bus and they're going to check our passports and use the bathroom if we want to. And so we're waiting on the bus um, after, you know, a long time to, to see what's going on. And then we see a guy come out in a full hazmat suit. And we were like, what? <laughs> what's going on here? You know, he comes out in a hazmat suit and he gets on the bus and he starts taking everybody's temperature with one of those, you know, those new laser thermometers that they point at your forehead. And we're all like, wait, what? <laughs> What's going on here? Um, <laughs> and then they, somebody on the bus has a fever. <laughs> and so they, they, uh, they say, you're not cleared. You can't, you can't go. So we're like, wait, what? And so that was the first thing, moment where we were all like, oh, is this that virus? And, um, you know, like, oh, man, what's what's going on? It, it took a long time. They had to get a doctor to come and talk to this woman who had a fever. And then eventually they just let us go. And so we were like, oh, wow, close call, but we made it. Maybe this is going to get serious, you know. And then shortly after that, um, we, uh, you know, maybe it was like February 12th or 14th or something, maybe February 14th. We, you know, we made our way home and got home no problem. But then right after that, we started seeing everywhere on that tour, they'd be like, oh, okay, two cases in Vienna, two cases in, you know, Croatia, and uh, Bosnia, like all the places that we went. Uh, we were, we started our tour in Trieste. You know, there's, of course, a big outbreak in Italy. You know, like we just started to see it pop up and like, whew, glad we made it home, you know. And uh, so anyway, um, it was definitely on my mind at that point. But going into the spring break here at the university, I was supposed to take my um, the ensemble that I coach here to, to Austria, to Graz, uh, um, because we have a partnership with uh, the University of Graz, and uh, we do an exchange where one year we send an ensemble there, one year they send an ensemble here. So it was the year for me to take a group over there and uh, there were kind of like, uh, you know, murmurings of, you know, that they, the trip might not happen. But I wasn't seeing any cases in uh, in Austria at that point, or maybe two somewhere else, but it wasn't enough to, like, cancel the thing. So anyway, they started saying, like, oh, okay, well, I don't know if it's going to happen, you know. And then, of course, like, you know, some of my, uh, the dean of my, uh, department comes and tells me, yeah, we're we're talking about this now. It, it may not happen. And then all of a sudden they're like, they suspend travel. They sp suspend all non-essential travel 
for uh, for the university. All university sponsored travel. So that was one of the first things. Like, okay, the trip for the kids to Europe is uh, is canceled. All right. So that's that's the first thing. And then later on, maybe the next week, right before the break, they say that okay, we're going to uh, have you guys not come back. Um, we're going to extend the break uh, one week or. Or something like that, you know, like, okay, all right, fine. So it's it's just really like school is being affected, but but just by a week. And then we get on break and they say, oh, okay, now uh, <laughs> we're not going to have to come back at all. All all uh, classes are going to go online for the rest of the year. Oh, wait, well, then it was just uh, two more weeks or something like that. And then, of course, they pushed it for the rest of the year. So school, I knew, was going to be online, fine. And then um, in March, you know, March, uh, all my gigs that, you know, that I had, which weren't a lot because it's going to be going most of the month anyway with the students, they started getting canceled. Um, I had some gigs, uh, some nice gigs for my group around, you know, at the Blue Llama and Ann Arbor and, um, you know, some other things going on. And I see April start to go. And then, uh, and then May, you know, starts to go. I had a nice residency I was looking forward to up in, uh, what's it, Rackdale, up in the north burbs of Chicago. And, and, uh, yeah, just kept toppling from there. You know, I think, um, when I got into May, I was like, well, okay, well, it looks like gigs are still going to happen in May. And then, of course, they get pushed in then June. All the kids got pushed, and then July, everything, you know. And then now, you know, that's where we are now is where um, there may not be any large um, festivals or anything until next spring. So, uh, but some smaller gigs might uh, be able to come back online. And I know that's city to city and state to state, but uh, I, I think things are, are going to start reopening if they don't uh, – you know, kind of blow back up into a, an outbreak. In Chicago, I know their plans were to start in uh, July and definitely by August um, for clubs uh, to open with social distancing with, uh, I think, a capacity of 50 people max, you know. But I don't know. So that's uh, <laughs> that's how it's affected, affected me, you know. Yeah, I think that's the thing about this. There's such a cloud of ambiguity over everything. I, I remember when this started, you know, I was, I have kids in school and they were going to do, you know, April 8th, they were going back and then it was like uh, April 24th. But I remember when baseball was called and there was yeah. an umpire that was leaving the field and I saw a tweet and somebody said, I mean, this was right when this happened in March and they canceled everything. The umpire looked back and said, we'll see all of you guys in June. And I remember my heart sank. I was like, what does this guy know? And I would just dismiss it because no one had said anything about anything long term. You know, at that point, yeah. they were like, you know, we're going to take two weeks off. The season will start later than usual. But this guy knew something. And I think that's the thing that's interesting. The more I've gone along, there are certain people that I think have had an idea of a keener idea of how long this was going to last, you know, um, but, you yeah. know. At any rate, what have you been doing creatively during quarantine to kind of keep your chops going? Well, um, I have to say that um, over the over the past few years, I've been very busy, you know, and and having a moment where um, you're kind of forced to stop and ask yourself, okay, all right, I have all this. Well, you know, I still had the, you know, the teach all my classes and everything online. But normally I would be, you know, running back to Chicago to play four gigs on the weekend or flying somewhere to play and all this, you know. And now just to have this moment of, okay, no, you're going to be in one place for a long time. So um, I, the first month was extremely productive. I was, um, I was, Really, we we were getting ready to record a new record for uh, my group, um, Rogue Parade, the quintet that uh, I released my last record on with, and um, and so we had made these plans to get together for these two days of 
workshopping all of this new material um, at the end of March. And so the entire, probably February and March, I was working really steadily on a bunch of new music for, for that. And so once uh, we went away for spring break, and that spring break turned out to be twice as long, I was just, you know, steady working on composition for that group. And and it was a wonderful, wonderful time because I really was focused, taking advantage of every moment um, to, uh, you know, just to really hopefully come out of the, come away from that time that was, um, kind of put on all of us with some with some really uh you know valuable material i could uh or really worked out material that I could share with the band and that we would workshop at the end of march but of course we we all had to cancel that because everything was locked down so yeah composition for for that group I think I was working on something like twenty different songs at that time for for the band and and trying to uh to you know, make sure I you know get my practicing in, and um, but outside of that, then some other interesting opportunities popped up. Like you know, people started doing lots of different collaborations. Um, there's um, there's a an organization uh, based in New York called Art is Live. I don't know if you've heard of this um, uh, solo concert series. It's started by a uh, great saxophonist Caroline Davis and Marta Sanchez. I believe I don't know Marta very well, but I believe she's a pianist. And um and so they uh got together and wanted to have people do solo concerts from their homes and you know, were raising money by via donations and they split all the money in in a certain amount of time period that the artists raised between all the artists equally. And so uh you know, I hadn't done many solo concerts before, so it was a great challenge to try to put together a set, um, a solo set period, but a solo set where nobody's there, you know, <laughs> that's a, a, a different thing. So so I did a solo set for them. Um, I did another solo concert for, uh, who was that for? Um well, I did another. I did actually did a collaboration. There's a there's a great uh, music, well, a great painter named Louis Achenbach, and uh, he paints uh, paints music. He lives in the Burbs, Chicago, and but he's uh, he kind of has gone all over the world painting to music at live, at live you know. And uh, we've done a lot of collaboration where he's doing live paint or real paint and digital stuff. So. We did a video collaboration where, uh, you know, he recorded, well, I recorded myself, and he, you know, kind of just improvised as I was freely improvising. And then so he did some video production after and put together this nice, uh, you know, nice product or, you know, just a nice experience and just, uh, you know, online. So those are some of the ways I've been staying creative, trying to find new ways to collaborate, trying to, you know, uh, take advantage of this time to study, to, you know, to shed, to, you know, make sure that I'm uh, happy about the direction um, that my my life and music are heading. And, and it's, you know, for for that, it's, you know, I'm, as I'm, I'm sure you have a similar experience, anytime you can just sit and think like, is this how, how I want things to go? You know, or what can I change? You know, and usually things are just go, go, go. You know, you know, maybe you can you can make little changes here, but um, that you don't, usually don't have this kind of time at all. <laughs> well, you're from Peoria, Illinois. Talk to me a little bit about growing up and how jazz became your life, music became your life. Sure. Um, yeah. So you're Peoria, Illinois. Um, you know. Medium sized city, you know, maybe 120,000, 130,000 people. Um, I was fortunate to be raised in a musical family. You know, I mean, that my, on, on my dad's side specifically, and my mom's side of the family, they were, you know, music enthusiasts. Um, but my, my dad, 
he still, uh, you know, he was a saxophonist, but he still plays a B3, you know, like, and uh, the whole time he was uh, very involved in playing at different churches in Peoria. Same thing for my uncle and my grandmother and my grandfather all played in, uh, you know, gospel music um, in different situations. So, you know, there was a family gospel group, and I remember being in that at the age of three, learning to sing these songs, and and I really hated that (laughs) because I was so shy. Um, But, you know, so beneficial just to be, you know, in the basement with my other cousins having to learn these things by ear from my uncle and, uh, you know, (laughs) <laughs> they were, he was very serious and uh you know so i mean you know kind of those were the the beginnings it's just coming up in that culture of you know going to church singing hearing choir singing hearing great music you know you know hearing like that had like improvisational sections so that that was the beginning um fourth grade started violin playing an orchestra ended up playing violin for nine years fifth grade started saxophone uh, pretty much just because I, uh, <laughs> my dad had his old saxophone, uh, so he gave it to me. I started to play that. And then um, I think when I was 11, I saw the Clint Eastwood film uh, Bird, and, and I first heard about, um, you know, uh, Charlie Parker, or, you know, heard about Charlie Parker, heard the music of Charlie Parker, and heard other uh, saxophone is playing in the style of bebop and i never heard anything like that but just seeing that film and hearing that soundtrack i knew that i would do this forever you know at that point it was just i wanted to play bebop forever <laughs> at 11 but of course that's uh expanded so um anyway peoria happened to be this really great or happened to have a great music community at that time um in the sixth grade, I start playing with my dad at church every week. Um, by the time I was in like different jazz bands, summer jazz bands, uh, that you know kind of brought together the community um, uh, throughout the city, like all kinds of players from different schools. Um, when I was a freshman in high school, Mary Jo Papage, uh, who is uh, you know a great uh, music educator, jazz educator, she um, starts uh what well, she had been running the Peoria Jazz All Stars, which is an all city um jazz band that she had to audition for. And, you know, would do a lot of gigs throughout the city and even do some traveling. Um so anyway, I started working with them and then they had a combo that would do gigs. So, you know, we start playing gigs professionally and then maybe I even got to start leading that group when I was fourteen. And uh, so we would go out and play and get paid at different places. And uh, I remember on one of those moments, I met a great artist and uh, musician named Preston Jackson, who was uh, in Peoria. And uh, Preston had a lot of work as a musician. <laughs> this is a kind of a life-changing experience for me. But they, I was 14, I had this band, and we were going to play at this uh, this Unitarian Church's um, Jazz Sunday. And they told me that he would come and sit in. And I knew who he was, so I was excited. I was like, oh, it's going to be great. So we uh, get, to the, get to the gig, and uh, he shows up, and he asked me what I want to play. And I still remember. I said, I, w- I want to play uh, Group and High. And he's like, okay. So we play the tune. And after the first song, you know, he says, he's like, damn, boy, you've been You've been shedding with Jesus. And uh, and I was just, you know, it was just like so funny to me. But he's a great player. And from that moment, we became, you know, best friends. And he would, uh, you know, give me, I played on every gig that he had. So there were so many opportunities uh, to play in Peoria, all kinds of styles of music. And by the time maybe I was a senior in high school, I was playing maybe five or six nights a week in Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> And wow. uh, you know, maybe even maybe even you know, I, I had a steady gig in Bloomington, uh, Illinois. So, you know, driving as a kid, you know, being like sixteen, I would drive forty minutes away every Wednesday night to play at this club in a, another city. And that was uh, that was so fun for me. <laughs> in my little three hundred dollar car. So, um 
so yeah, that that's the beginning, and that's what happened in Peoria. In in between there, I was uh, becoming involved in the Chicago scene. When I was 15, I met a great trumpet player named Maurice Brown, and well, we met when I was 14, but um, we became friends. And then when I was 15, I would take a little bus. There was a little $19 bus. <laughs> The Peoria Charter Coach, you could take the bus up to Chicago. And Maurice, who was he was one year older than me, so he could drive. So he would pick me up from Midway Airport. <laughs> and we'd go and play all over the south side of Chicago until like 4 in the morning. And, you know, we'd go hear Vaughn Freeman and, and uh, you know, go to City Life and the New Apartment Lounge and, you know, hang out all night you know my parents had no idea what i was doing but it was you know some of the best experiences of my life you know so so that's the beginning <laughs> right on well you've gone on to really branch out into a whole lot of different genres that I, I was noticing along with jazz i really like kind of experimental music like prefuse 73 and tortoise uh -huh. how did you uh how did you get involved with them um so tortoise you know, Tortoise was always like, well, first of all, I went to Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois, which is like 60 miles from Chicago. So during that time period, I was going to Chicago all the time, you know, like almost, you know, five days a week minimum playing in the city. I was hosting a, a session at the Velvet Lounge. And then um, through through those experiences, um, I started to, you know, make a lot of connections in, with the music community. And Tortoise was always a band that you'd hear about. Like, for me, I, you know, like I was still, you know, just learning about what's going on on the scene up here. And I'd always hear about Tortoise, people playing me the records. I'd be like, oh, that sounds good. And then, you know, like at the jam session that I hosted, uh, Jeff Parker, he came in one day. I never knew who this guy was. And I had been on the scene for a few years and just had never met him yet. And I was like, wow, this guitar player is so amazing. This is incredible, you know. And then um, I start to hear uh, about Tortoise and that he's in Tortoise. I was like, oh, yeah, cool, you know. And so anyway, we had maybe played in a few situations, but um, and still I didn't know. I really didn't know what the band was, you know. But he called and said, hey, man, you want to play this gig with Tortoise? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, great. And so, um, you know, I go to their rehearsal space in Humble Park, and and I have no idea what's going to go on. You know, there's no music beforehand. And, and we go in uh, with maybe a couple other horn players. Uh, I think maybe uh, trombone player Nick Brosty and a cornetist uh, John Josh Berman, I think. But uh, anyway, we start to play, and the music is wonderful. I'm like, oh, man, I love this stuff. And I had no idea. I mean, these other great musicians in the band, uh, you know, John McIntyre, John Herndon, you know, all the cats. And, and so anyway, I'm like, great, that sounds wonderful. You know, so the gig is at Millennium Park here in Chicago, which was, I think it was just opening. Maybe this was 2004 or 2005 or something like that. Anyway, we go to play the show. And we walk out on the stage, and there's 12,000 people. And I'm like, I didn't know that Tortoise was this big. <laughs> so that was uh, <clears throat> my experience with uh, playing with Tortoise. And I mean, you know, like these guys were like rock stars. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it was kind of like, uh, you know, just on the job uh, experience. Like, oh, wow, this music, just see it fully realized, because, you know, with the giant. Uh, you know, sound system for 12,000 people. Of course, you don't get that experience in a practice room. You know, it's like, how is this music going to come off? And then also, just to, to find out, like, the kind of following that these musicians that I had, you know, been seeing on the scene in Chicago for a couple of years um, at that point, you know, like, oh, wow, look at the, the effect. Look at the, the following. Look at, you know, look at what's possible with instrumental music. So... Um, so, yeah, that was a great experience. And um, maybe around that same time, 2004, 2005, um, Prefuse was using, um, he was using a, a couple of our friends 
in his band that was uh, going on tour, um, uh, Marcus Evans, great drummer, and uh, Josh Abrams, great bassist. And um, we knew that Marcus told us that he got this gig playing, you know, with this uh, electronica guy, you know, and we're like, oh, okay, great, you know. And Marcus had been in my quartet for a year or so at that time, and uh, he was going to, you know, this was before any of us were really going on tour. And so he was like the first guy who was like, yeah, we're going to go on tour, you know. We're going on tour. On, and this is where bands, well, that band <clears throat> would do the entire world. <laughs> I remember they start like in Japan and just basically, you know, you know, go through different parts of Asia and then do all of Europe, do all of North America, South America. You know, I, I don't think many people are, are were touring Africa at that time. But, uh, um you know, it was an incredible thing to see. And then we uh, happened to be at the show. We wanted to see them come through Chicago, so they played the Empty Bottle. And, uh, you know, at this one, I still never, I didn't listen to a previous record beforehand. So we went to the show totally, you know, without any expectations. And the bill was amazing. It was a, a rapper named Beans. And um, and the <laughs> the band opening for for uh previews was battles. <laughs> and I don't know if you're familiar wow. with this, you know, Mass or our group, you know, but Sound at Braxton and um, yeah. you know, and then of course they were going to be so huge after this um after that tour. But uh but then previews, you know, seeing that show with uh people playing with, you know, like uh, with tracks and NPCs and um and you know the way that you know previews kind of blended the recorded with the live music was just a an amazing thing to experience at the time. So, um, yeah, I mean, and that that kind of blew my mind. And then I think for the uh, you know knowing Josh, he was producing some of previews's music, uh, and so um, he called me. <laughs> I remember it was the. What was it? It was the uh, Savatha Savala's record. They were doing it over at, at John McIntyre's studio, uh, Soma, here in Chicago. And I was on a, I was, where was I? I was in, I was in Minneapolis playing at the Symphony Center with Tito Puente Jr. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I got a call like, can you, uh, can you come back? Co- you know, can you come to the studio and record with previous? I was like, oh man, we're we're doing this concert in Minneapolis, but uh, we're, we're going to fly right after the show, and I'll come to the studio after that. And so, um, so I yeah, I got back to Chicago and went straight to the studio, and yeah, you know, just had a wonderful time recording with Prefuse. Um, you know, like his musical concept was really like a kind of like art. You know, and like you know, he I remember like him just the way he would describe what he wanted me to do was it wasn't really like you know technically you know, like musical, you know, he's like, I, I'm kind of looking for this sound or this color or, and so it was fun to go back and forth, um, you know, because this was kind of like the beginning of my studio work, you know, like I hadn't really done so much outside of going in and playing parts, but when you get to work with, uh, you know, another artist's vision who maybe doesn't uh, know how to describe what they want you to do on clarinet, but if you can be open and sort of show them a bunch of different options and find and be patient enough to find the right thing, um, you know, you can you can get to something together. And so that was that was wonderful for me. It's wonderful to work on uh that record with him and yeah. I uh <laughs> I still wish uh I every once in a while I reach out to him to see uh see if uh we can do something together. But uh, nothing's happened yet. So my question to you is this, too. You know, we're going to get to the end of COVID-19, and we're going to get back to full-on live music. And when we do, what do you hope both the musician and the audience realizes from this time away from live music? Hmm. Well, um, well, I, I think it's a... Uh, I feel like everybody has an opportunity to to sort of check their 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 trajectory, right? Like, what was what they were doing before this was that uh you know like the most the richest thing that you could produce was that the the thing you really wanted to be investigating you know like 
so I guess maybe like kind of reinforcing your passion, right? Because, you know, what would you do? I guess if everybody's finding out the answer to what would you do if there were no gigs? What would you do? What would you investigate? What would you refine if you had nowhere to be or nobody to show it to, you know? So I'm hoping that everybody asks, has been asking those questions, has been finding out the answers to those questions. I know I am. And uh, therefore brings, you know, like really brings forth some material that you really believe in and are excited, can't wait to share with uh, with people. And also the same thing for the audience. You hope that <clears throat> people will, I hope there's like, a, you know, sort of a, I don't know, like <laughs> everybody's been living so much online, right? You know, you know, watch watch movies at home, uh, digital digital hangouts. Um, you know, maybe even before we had to, and so maybe this is going to make people, you know, take advantage of every opportunity to experience something in person. You know, once this is all over, because you'll have a a memory of when you couldn't. You know, and how important it is to you know, interact with each other on, on these different levels to go out and experience art together, to go out and just, you know, take a walk with somebody, you know, to go to a, have a meal, see a play, see an art exhibition live. Like, I hope that this is uh, the beginning of, you know, a return <laughs> to uh, live experiences. You know, I know it is for me. I know as soon as, like, you know, everything's good, you know, everything's clear that I want to be, you know, as, you know, as much as I can with the people experiencing that. Because, you know, like you, um, yeah, we all need it. We're all social people. And I think there's, uh, we've been sort of putting ourselves in these, uh, you know, digital boxes <laughs> for a long time. Or, yeah. you know, at least over the past, you know, 14 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, my final question is this. Everyone has a version of you, a perception of you, your family, your friends, and your fans, that you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Hmm. Oh, man, that's a good one. Um, I I feel like I am uh, I'm curious. You know, I want to know. Uh, I want to know as much as I can. I want to question as much as I can. I want to find out. You know, like I want to find about. I I just want to investigate the things that are, you know, interesting me. You know, whether that's uh, brought on by, you know, my own curiosity, my own desires for, you know, art, music, uh, my own experiences with life, family, friends. You know, I want to. I don't know. I just I want to be open. You know, I want to. Um, to get the most out of things. I don't know. I feel like I'm an, inv- an investigator. <laughs> and uh, that those are the things that excite me. It's like when you find something that you're, you're passionate about and, you know, like those things change. You know, you might be excited about, you know, a certain thing for a while or you might have an assignment or a, you know, a project and that's very exciting. Or, you know, your life may bring you to a, a certain experience and you really have to dig into, to, uh, you know, figure out what's going on and, and how um, you, you know, how you're going to move, where you're going to go from this. What are you going to learn from this? So, so I'd say <laughs> I feel like an investigator, you know, and I have maybe since the age of 11 when I found out who Charlie Parker was because maybe that, that's the first moment where I was, it was something that was mine. It wasn't something that my parents were like, hey, you know what, you should, be in the family gospel group, or you, you should play violin because you can, you know. Or we have a saxophone. You can be if you want to be in band, you can do that, you know. It was like Charlie Parker. I want to do that, you know. And so I set out to, you know, investigate who this person was, you know. And so I feel like that's that's me, you know, somebody who wants to, uh, you know, investigate the life that's in front of me, you know. And yeah, hopefully. Uh, uh, do some good with it. Beautiful, man. Hey, thank you for taking a little time out for Neon Jazz today. I really appreciate it. Um, stay safe and good luck with everything, man. 
Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Greg for his time, talent, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.